Hello, friends. On this glorious day in drink history, we're going to talk about the drinks market, as my guest is Danny Brager. Mr. Brager serves as the Senior Vice President of Beverage Alcohol Practice at Nielsen, which is a word you may have heard used in reference as to why your favorite TV show is dropped from the network or how successful that hilarious Super Bowl commercial was. Nielsen was founded in 1923, and in addition to tracking what consumers watch, they also track what consumers buy. Today, Nielsen has around 40,000 employees and is a major resource in tracking spirits and cocktail trends, which I was excited to learn more about in my conversation with Mr. Bragger. Let's do this. This episode of the Educational Drinking Show is sponsored by Junipero Gin, which is the original American craft gin going back to 1996 and the pioneering work of Fritz Maytag, which also makes it the gin of San Francisco. In 98.6 proof, Junipero is a bit stronger than most gins and perfect in your favorite gin cocktail. Good stuff. And with that, it's my great pleasure to share with you my interview with Danny Brager of Nielsen. Nielsen is a global measurement company and we measure what people watch and we measure what people buy. So you think about the watch side, it's wherever people find out about products, TV, radio, online, uh, places like that. We measure all that. And we also measure what people buy and what people buy uh, includes what products they buy, when do they buy it, where do they buy it, why do they buy it, and, and who they are. And how do you go about measuring that? A lot of complexity, it really depends on what specific thing we're measuring, but if I can give you an example on the what people buy side, uh, we have arrangements with uh, retail stores as on-premise and off-premise, so you know, stores where people go in to buy products, but also restaurants and bars, we get their scanning data, and we have to interpret all of the information that comes with that aggregated up so that we can provide a measurement of what products people are actually buying. And what specifically do you do at Nielsen? So I have a fun job. Um, everybody wants my job. I don't want to give it up. But I, <laughs> I head up our uh, beverage alcohol practice. So we have relationships with 150 or 200 companies, beer, wines, and spirits companies. We have a lot of people who actually work with those clients individually day to day. But I sort of broadly support all of their activities. Um, I'm the liaison with various industry groups like the WSWA, for example, um, as well as other ones. Um, we entertain a lot of requests from the media for information. Um, we have a lot of global inquiries that come in. I speak at a lot of industry events, so that's the fun part of my job, I guess. How long has Nielsen been tracking beverage-related data? Oh, goodness. Well, I know our company goes back to the 1920s. I don't know exactly when we started, you know, when we started tracking products. So I don't know exactly when we started tracking beverage alcohol, but you know, it's been multiple years on years on years because what clients, what our clients want to know is just not what they sell now, but what they sold in the past. And the other view that we provide is not just what they sell, it's what their competitors sell so that we can provide sort of an overall view of how is beer doing, various products in beer, same with wine, same with spirits over long periods of time. How important is, is a service like Nielsen to the ecosystem of the beverage industry? It's, I mean, at the end of the day, every supplier is uh, their success is going to be based on what the consumer ends up buying. It doesn't matter what you ship or what a distributor depletes, all that can happen. But if the consumer doesn't pull the product through the system, then all else, you know, all else goes for naught. So it's important to understand what is the consumer doing um, because that's the ultimate telltale of success. So that's where we come in. What is the consumer buying? And also providing every company with a competitive view of, you know, they might be growing, for instance, 5%, but if everyone else is growing 10%, then you're, you know, you're know, you not growing as fast as others. So there's opportunity that's there, um, and you don't know it unless you know the whole market. Now, are you just tracking data, or are you also doing analysis? Well, we do a ton of analysis. Um, 
So obviously there's lots involved in collecting it and reporting it, but where I think the value add comes in is what does it all mean? So we sit on top of millions, billions, bits of data, but it's just data unless somebody can say, can, can look at it and, and find some insights. And so that's the fun part of my job is one, one of them is, is to see what's going on. What are the trends? What's, what's hot? What's not? Where should a company, if they're looking out to the future, where should they look for future growth? What are they doing wrong now? All those sorts of things. What's unique to doing this kind of tracking work in the beverage industry versus other industries? Well, if, if we say beverage alcohol business, mm -hmm. um, I think what makes it unique is a few different things. Huge complexity in the legalities of what you can sell and where you can sell it and how you can sell it that doesn't exist in most other industries. So when we collect all of our information, we have to sort of funnel it through the complexities of legal, what's legal, what's not. So I'll give you one quick example. We have a consumer panel that provides us with a lot of information. For every other category, we look at consumers, you know, 18 plus. I mean, that's a pretty standard demo, 18 to 24. In the beverage alcohol industry, that obviously doesn't work so where it's 21 plus, so we have to filter everything through a 21 plus lens. That's just one example. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other example is just um, very unique distribution channels. Our Procter & Gamble and Unilever and Kraft, they don't really care too much about restaurants and bars and liquor stores. Our clients, our clients care a lot about those things that are unique to the beverage alcohol industry. Mm -hmm. So we have to make sure that we measure whatever consumers buy products, which involves channels other than what other categories are involved with. Do the things that make the beverage industry unique for your work create kind of opportunities to provide stronger analysis or do they provide challenges that make it harder to do your job? <laughs> Both. Yeah? Yeah, totally. I mean, it's to measure bars and to measure you know, on-premise bars, restaurants, etc. That is hugely challenging. It, just imagine in a store when you buy products, you get this nice everything is scanned by a UPC code. In a bar and restaurant, there's nothing that's a UPC code. So mm -hmm. we have to figure out both how to collect the data and how to interpret it through a very different mechanism that we would use elsewhere. So totally challenging, but, but obviously that's what, you know, what our job is to, to solve for the challenges. I have to think with the emergence of craft and smaller brands, your job's gotten a lot more complicated compared to what it may have been in the past with a lot bigger brands. Yes and no. I mean, the collection is still the same. Um, it's much more fragmented, the industry, because of craft. Um, so we're tracking more products, but mm -hmm. that's, not, that's not in itself challenging for us. There's lots of categories where we track lots and lots of products. We're just tracking more now. It makes it much more, certainly interesting, a um, lot of activity. And the other thing is the emergence of craft may be a little bit newer in the craft spirit side, but in the craft beer side, you know, that's been the case for several years now. So we've got lots of experience in tracking that fragmentation because there's historical precedent for some of that even within beverage alcohol. What's your favorite part of your job? When you get up in the morning, what do you like? Yeah, today I get to do that. Talk with clients. Yeah. <laughs> um, be externally focused, not internally. Every big company, we're, we're in 100 countries, we have 35,000 employees, there's lots of complexity, internal stuff to deal with. That's not terribly fun but getting out talking with clients about their business so I can learn from them as to challenges they're facing makes me smarter and helping them sort of helping them be successful at the end of the day if someone says hey you said something and I did something because of it that's the absolute best part of my job I mean within that there's lots of fun we deal with them like I said the media industry events I present at 20 or 30 industry events every year oh, wow. uh, it's a lot of fun um, a lot of work goes into it but but those are all fun you know relatively speaking to the internal stuff that's the fun part and how long have you been doing what you're doing so I've been with Nielsen for over 30 years I actually started wow. in, started in Canada I know I look so young right um, <laughs> I started in Canada um, then moved down to the States um, with Nielsen I actually wasn't involved in beverage alcohol at that point. I actually left Nielsen for a few years, joined another company that was involved in sort of the beverage alcohol industry that had a relationship with Nielsen. Totally not to do with myself, but Nielsen ended up buying that company, um, and I ended up back with Nielsen. And then uh, since then, that was about 13, 14 years ago, I've been with Nielsen in the beverage alcohol area uh, ever since. And like I said, uh, Love it. Wouldn't want to work in another industry. Man, that's a long time. That's a long time.
You were listening to like U2's Unforgettable Fire on cassette on your way to your first <laughs> day of imagine. work. I was going to say Beatles something something. But yeah, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I go back a bit. But uh, the other fascinating thing about this industry for me is uh, having that historical perspective on mm-hmm. trends really helps, I think. And then the other really interesting thing and cool thing about this industry is people move around a lot. Like they were with one company and came to this company. Mm-hmm. Dennis at, at Anchor, Matt Davenport at Anchor, you know, on the, on the beer side. I mean, I've known them from other parts of the industry, and that's how it kind of rolls, in, 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 at least in beverage alcohol. When you reflect on your career, whether it's work that you've done yourself or work that, you know, Nielsen has done as a whole, is there anything that you're particularly proud of in terms of how that work has positively affected the industry? Oh, that's a great question. Um, what have we done? I mean, there's the market measurement that I think people make better decisions with information. They make decisions to do things. And in, in a lot of cases, frankly, they make decisions not to do things that we save them a ton of money. Mm-hmm. Um, we do innovation work for clients, for instance, and clients have a lot of ideas and concepts about what to do. I mean, we'll tell them based on our research what we think will work and what won't work. And I think, you know, again, we've helped where we've said in, in both cases, like to do something or not to do something. Um, there's various individual clients that I've worked on. I obviously can't get into proprietary mm-hmm. stuff, but, you know, where I think we, you know, our company has made a difference in terms of how the decisions that they've made res- with respect to their own businesses. Mm-hmm. And then I think we've just, I think to some degree, we sort of moved the agenda. We spent a lot of time talking about craft, for instance. Mm-hmm. You know, what moves consumers to buy craft spirits, what, um, why it's a good thing for the industry, um, what are the financials associated with it. So I, I think we contribute to certain sectors and their growth just by fueling the discussion with, fact, with facts, you mm-hmm. know, not just conjecture, but actual facts about what consumers think or what sells or the financials associated with that. Any thoughts on what the world of craft looks like in spirits over like the next five years? Growing. <laughs> I think the last estimate, well, I'll give you a perspective. In, in beer, craft is on dollars well over 20%. Um, on volume, probably in the mid-teens, 12, 13, 14, something like that percent uh, volumetrically. Um, craft spirits, the latest number I saw, and again, there's all sorts of different definitions of what, what is craft, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, which is craft is really in the eyes of the consumer and the consumer doesn't always agree what's craft but the latest number I saw was about 2% Mm -hmm. of volume larger in whiskey probably but growing at three to four times maybe five times faster than the total spirits category Wow! Um, and I don't see that changing I mean there's just way too much energy in, in craft there's way too much consumer I mean way too much not in a bad way lots of consumer interest in craft it's what drives younger generations they want to try something new different and are willing to pay a higher price and the higher price sort of that premium price that's what's attractive to all the distribution um, points along the way the distributor the retailer i mean they like if, if consumers are willing to buy high price products that's more money for everybody along the way and you're satisfying the consumer uh outside of craft specifically are there any categories that you find extra encouraging at the moment yeah. Um, so whiskey broadly. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's the biggest category by value, and it's the strongest growing one. Or sorry, this, well, I should say probably the second strongest growing one. And some of that's driven by craft, but not exclusively. Um, tequila, um, growing double digits. That's mm-hmm. probably the second biggest one. And lots of, there's a craft element in that too, but obviously there has, there's a Hispanic element, which is a obviously a growing part of the American population um, and cognac's actually interesting smaller segment but large growth as well um, and a lot of all of that is really happening at the premium and ultra premium end which um, is also generally a pretty healthy sign for the industry are there general underlying factors that tend to contribute to trends developing in the, the spirits well I think I, I always everything that I do when I start with even looking at things, I always start with the consumer. Like, mm-hmm. what, what's changing with the consumer? How are they thinking? How are they feeling? If I go back to 2009, 2010, during the Great Recession, they weren't feeling too good. And so you know it's going to have an impact on their pocketbooks. And so it wasn't the ultra-premium end of spirits that was mm-hmm. growing. It was more the mid-size you know, the, the, the mid segment or the mid-portion of the, of the category. 
So I always start with the consumer. What's changing in their attitudes? What's changing in their makeup? What's changing generationally? What's changing gender-wise, et cetera, et cetera. So I always start off with there. So if we look at you know, multicultural growing um, and various elements within multicultural, then you start looking at well, what do Hispanics, what types of products do they prefer? and they're growing, then you sort of put those things together and look at, okay, what are the spirits products that are marketing to Hispanics or that Hispanics tend to prefer, and then you see the growth. So it all kind of, in my opinion, starts with the consumer. Then there's structural things that impact that sort of, you know, the legal changes in what's allowed to be sold where. There's new new and different ways that consumers can buy products these days with, with e-commerce. So there's a lot of structural things, but it still, it starts with the consumer. I may be way off here, but I've always kind of looked at the beverage consumer as being a little insecure, a little confused, and, and I think the consumers in beverage have certainly evolved a lot in recent years, but does that make it a more complex consumer, and how much can the industry really drive trends simply by what they're marketing behind, what they're pushing out there into the market? I don't, confused? I'm not sure. It's certainly... I think they'd like increasingly to explore. Mm -hmm. um, so if confusion and exploration are one and the same, maybe. Yeah. But there's certainly a desire for consumers to, you know, brand loyalty, for instance, probably challenge more now than it ever was. Because mm -hmm. consumers just generally like to try different things. And on top of that, the industry has facilitated that by having so many more and different and unique uh, products for them to try so it sort of goes together so I'm not sure you know what comes first is it the chicken or the egg but yeah. it's probably again I think generationally if I think of millennials I mean they are much more eager to try something new and they don't have the experience of what they like yet mm -hmm. so you put those things together and you see all this trial mm -hmm. and maybe it'll they will settle down after they've tried lots of different things but at the beginning it's like bring it on <laughs> Are there any spirits categories that stand out to you as potentially slowing down in coming years? Um, slowing down. I mean, there's two that are challenged today. Mm -hmm. um, so the two that are most challenged, and there's another one that I'll throw in there that's actually growing pretty well, even though I think people think maybe it's not as much. So the, the two that are challenged are gin and rum. Uh -huh. um, they, rum in particular, it's, it's flat. There's not a lot of growth in the ultra premium side, so that's challenging right now. Mm -hmm. um, gin's pretty flat. And the other one, which actually is it's still growing, but, but maybe the shine's a little bit off because whiskey has just been so dominant and everyone's, you know, the industry mm -hmm. discussion is vodka. Vodka's actually the biggest category by volume, not by dollars, but by volume. And it's actually growing at mid-single digits, but only half as much as whiskey. So... <laughs> Um, that one, I still think, you know, that it's big and it'll continue to grow, maybe not at the huge rates that it was a few years ago. Outside of specific categories, are there any trends that you think are significant in, in alcoholic beverage right now? Well, two things. Um, one is just trading up. Mm -hmm. Whether it's beer or wine or spirits, consumers are trading up. Um, so if I bought a bottle of wine for ten dollars last year now I'm buying a twelve dollar bottle of wine if I bought a 15 I'm buying a 17 I mean that has been the case for beer wine and spirits now for you know a few years since the Great Recession sort of the the, the, the negative effects started to lessen um, so definitely that one the other one probably more so less less so for wine certainly for spirits and a little bit in beer is just the flavors mm -hmm. um, just this if I look at whiskey, it's I think about 14% of whiskey sales are coming from flavored products. If I go back even three or four years ago, that was almost nothing. Mm -hmm. I and mean, that's massive. Um, and in beer, we're starting to see the same thing. You can get a, you can buy an, you know, an IPA with grapefruit flavor um, and, and watermelon and mango and all these different things. And there's mm -hmm. the hard sodas with root beer flavors and orange cream. Um, so that involvement of sort of flavor is pretty interesting and is certainly a trend that I think will continue. I, I had the opportunity to interview Craig Wolf yesterday, okay. and one of the things he brought up as being something on people's minds in this industry is the impact of marijuana as legalization yeah. uh, takes place. Is that something you see Nielsen getting into? Measuring? Yeah. <laughs> um, if it becomes commercial? Good question. I mean, I certainly, I think 
quite possibly that's that's <laughs> what we do is measure stuff it doesn't really matter what stuff as long as it's through legal channels um i think the question that i guess that get asked a lot is what has been the impact of marijuana legalization on beverage alcohol consumption i get that asked that a lot and so far <laughs> based on everything that i've read and seen and heard from other people is it's hard to know but it doesn't really seem like it's negatively impacted to any big degree yeah um but i think we probably need a bit more years uh, a trend to really understand it plus um you know it's likely that a few more states over the course of the next couple of years will also legalize so we'll have more mm -hmm. stuff to sort of study <laughs> i would love to see a trends presentation by you on marijuana commercially <laughs> talking about how sour diesel is outpacing projections and OG Kush is the dark horse of, of the industry. And okay. that sounds like a rollicking good time. It does. I'll put it on my to-do list. <laughs> <laughs> and what about uh, just spirits, alcohol overall? What, what's the outlook? I think it's really positive. Yeah. I, I actually think that of the three categories, beer, wine, spirits, that has the, the most positive outlook um, for a few reasons. And I think innovation... Oh, I think the craft thing is driving spirits, um, and it did drive beer, but um, and it's still driving beer to some extent. But it's if I look at beer, a lot of the craft beer gains are coming at the expense of other beers, so mm -hmm. it's not really impacting the total total category in, in a big way. But in spirits, um, craft spirits are dynamic and are helping the growth. And there's just so much innovation and so many things you can do with spirits. That mm -hmm. If I think of like wine. To me, just as a consumer, like there's less that I can kind of do with it. Mm -hmm. And spirits, there's just so many new and different things, flavors and mixing, you know, mixology, and it's just so cool. When you reflect back on your career, are there any trends that come to mind as just legendary, where guys stand around the Nielsen headquarters, just talk about the good old days when that one trend happened and you guys were on top of it and <laughs> just managed to create so much productiveness out of it? Hmm. Well, flavors we talk about a lot. We, flavors is kind of interesting in that, so it sounds all good, but there's so many mistakes that we've made. So like within flavors, we try to steer people to, there's good flavors and maybe, there's, maybe the best way to describe is we, I like to talk about trends mm -hmm. and I like to distinguish trends from fads. And, and try what's the to, difference? Oh, it's huge. Like a trend, in my opinion, is something that's long lasting. A fad is short lasting mm. and if we can st save some companies from, if you if you want to get into a fad, you better do it at the beginning, um, and know when not to get into it and know when to get out of it. And I see so many companies that, even two years after my analysis would have said, don't bother getting in it, they're still getting into stuff. So yeah. I, I think we've saved people from getting into some fads, or at least try to warn them, and try to steer people towards what are the what are the longer lasting things that will still be with us two or three years from now. But I can think of many examples where. It was a fat. Yeah. Um, Anything come to mind? Uh, I can probably think of three. Yeah. Um, how about something like chocolate, chocolate wine? Actually, two or three years ago, a few companies were getting into it, and it went, you know, up and down. Um, <laughs> about three or four years ago, everyone—not everyone—several companies were getting into um, alcohol in pouches that you could freeze, mm -hmm. and sort of, and then you take it home, you unfreeze it, and drink it. That was everyone was talking about its growth. I sort of predicted that was going to be a couple year growth, three mm -hmm. years, and then fail miserably, and mm -hmm. it has. Um, and then I guess a third example, and it had some legs for a while. But if I think of flavored vodkas, so there's the fruit flavored vodkas. That's okay, but there was also a lot of um, dessert and confection type kinds mm -hmm. of vodkas, cake, whipped cream, bubble gum. I mean, these were all real names of flavors that companies launched and those things took off for a really short while and just died quickly man it's such a fascinating world that you exist in it's kind of fun yeah there's like i said could be it's it's the <laughs> it's it's the fun it's a fun industry within you know a company that measures 125 categories i really like these three beer wine spirits yeah that's fun well, thank you so much for taking a little bit of time and, and sharing your world with us and some stories and insights. Yeah, great. Thank you, Al. Appreciate the time. <laughs>